Christ for the world we sing. The world to Christ we bring with loving zeal. The poor and them that mourn, the faint and overborn, sin sick and sorrow worn, whom Christ doth heal. Christ for the Redeemed at countless cost from our despair. Good morning. Welcome to our study in Acts. My name is Clint McElroy, and this morning will be in Acts chapter 28. As a reminder, this morning we will have services at the auditorium, so do join us at 10 a.m. if you can. Today we'll be wrapping up our reading in Acts. Next week, I'll go through a review process of 20, chapters 20 through 28 and looking at things I left unaddressed along the way. And we'll see if we can build a couple of videos on that uh, to help us round out our study in Acts. As you recall, our study is rooted in the one of the final stories out of the book of Luke, the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus who were joined by a third man along the way and as they traveled together they found they had a burning in their hearts that they found absent once he left their presence they recognized that he was the christ and that that burning in their hearts was caused by his presence his teaching in their lives and i believe that we can find that burning in our own heart we can keep it kindled in our hearts through a continuous study of god's word a study that's not rooted simply in the reading of the word but a concentrating on what the Word says, meditation on the Word as we have opportunity throughout the day, centering ourselves on what the Word says and how we can conduct our lives in a way that's in accord with the principles and precepts we find written there. So I hope you will join us now as we enter into this study of God's Word. Acts chapter 28 from the NIV. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was rainy and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and, as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dys dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. Verse 9. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sell, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. Verse 11. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship and with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day the south wind came up, and on the following day we reached Puteoli. Verse 14. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius, and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. 
Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. Verse 20. For this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. Verse 22. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Verse 24, some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Verse 26, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Verse 28, therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So we find ourselves at the conclusion of the story. This part of the story more or less begins with Paul being taken into custody at the temple and having been held by the Romans for a period of time facing questioning, interrogation, continuing conversations with the Roman leadership and the Jewish uh, royalty, as well as interludes with the Sanhedrin and their accusations against him. He finally appeals to Caesar and that appeal is honored by the, the Roman governor Festus and he's sent on. Last week we read how the first part of the trip was a journey at sea under the custody of the Roman guard, how there were various obstacles. It was late in the season to be traveling on the sea. And there were many impediments to getting to their location, their final destination. They faced a terrible storm that wrecked the ship that they were in. And that's kind of where we left off. So this week we pick up in chapter 28 with the continuation of those events after the shipwreck. Before we get into the details of the chapter 28, I think it is worthy of a, a little additional scrutiny. Chapter 27 introduces us to yet another set of irregular circumstances that Paul finds himself in. When we look at what our responsibilities as Christians are, sometimes we want to take the easiest path and the easiest path often involves doing not much of anything. The Lord has prepared tasks for us, things that he expects us to do as Christians in his name. And I think that it is our choice whether or not we do those things. But if we leave those things undone, how, how is this message impeded to those who might need to hear it? Is the path for the message completely stopped for some people? I don't believe that it is, but I do believe that our part should be played out according to God's plan and not to our own plan. That's part of part and parcel with accepting Christ into our lives and giving up our own desires and our own will for our life in order to accommodate God's will for our life. When we face obstacles, do we just give up? Do we quit? Paul had a destination God had for him in mind. He didn't know how he was going to get there. But these things that kept presenting themselves as obstacles certainly didn't stop him. 
these were things that Jewish people by nature didn't normally experience. There were not many given to traveling by the sea. Paul had traveled by the sea before. It was certainly a scary proposition to anyone un, unaccustomed to travel at sea, especially late season travel when storms were red, when storms might arise out of, out of nowhere. I think the message there that perhaps I didn't expound on sufficiently last week was that we should not let the obstacles we find in our lives stop us from serving the Lord that we love and we respect and honor, want to honor in, the, in our lives. He's made a great sacrifice to ensure our salvation. What is our response gonna be? Is it gonna be to stop because someone might get mad at us because there are dangerous things in the world that might threaten us if we go about doing what the Lord would benefit from, that our own lives might be put in danger, that the lives of our loved ones might be put in danger because we want to serve God and tell his message to those who have not heard it, who need to hear it before they're, before they're eternally lost. These are important questions, and they're questions that don't go away the moment we're baptized. They don't go away the moment we decide to commit our lives to God. They're recurring. And that recurring challenge demands a recurring response of commitment to God. So as we go on into chapter 28, these are some things to keep in mind. The challenges haven't stopped. We're going to see some interesting things happen to Paul in chapter 28. So in chapter 28, we find that Having escaped the ocean or the, the sea there, they found out that the island that they were on was called Malta. The inhabitants there were very kind to them and they built them a fire. And it was apparently raining and cold. Paul was sitting about to gather some sticks and as he was casting the sticks into the fire, uh, it says a viper bidding, uh, fastened his fastened onto his hand, it says in verse 3. The natives saw the viper attached to his hand and assumed that he was going to die. They knew that the viper was deadly and he would die shortly and it would swell up and it would be very nasty and very unpleasant. So they were quite surprised when that didn't occur. And having seen that it didn't occur, they wanted to call him a god. There was an estate there on the island belonging to the leading citizen of the island, it says in verse 7, whose name was Publius. And he kept them there, and it says that he showed them courtesy for three days. It says that Publius's father was sick with a fever, and Paul went in to him and laid his hands on him and healed him. And of course, as a result, many of the sick on the island came and were also healed. The people there honored the men present in many different ways, it says, and they provided all their necessities for continuing their trip. In verse 11, it says, after three months, they sailed in an Alexandrian ship that had wintered there to Syracuse. And there's something said about the nature of the figurehead of the ship, which has to do with the way that those sailors honored their gods. After landing at Syracuse, they stayed three days, and then from there, they circled round and it says they reached Regium. And again, I'm reading out of the New King James Version now, not the NIV. So some of the names are slightly different. And after one day of the south wind blew and they went on to a town or a place called Putilio, Putioli, Putioli, Putioli. I've had to practice saying that several times because that does not roll off my tongue. Where we found brethren, it says, and were invited to stay with them seven days. So there was a lot of hospitality shown to Paul along the way here as they encountered the various obstacles they did encounter. And he says that they went on to Rome. When they got there, they found that some brethren had heard of them, and they came as far as Appy Forum and the Three Inns, which must have been known places in their in their at their time. And when Paul saw them present themselves to welcome them, he was thankful to God and, and took courage from it. 
They went on into Rome proper and they were delivered to the captain of the guards. And Paul was permitted to live by himself with a guard that kept him. It says after three days, Paul met with the Jewish leaders, I guess, of Rome and it questioned them. It says they had a conversation about why Paul was there and the accusations that had been made against him in Jerusalem and why he had appealed to Caesar. And he made a claim in verse 20 that this was the reason that he was there. For the hope of Israel, he was bound with this chain. The leaders there said that they had not heard from Judea in regard to him at all, but they had heard something about this sect and they wanted to hear more about that. So they set aside a time and when the day came, many people came to his lodging and he presented to them about the kingdom of God through the law and the prophets, explaining what things meant. It says in verse 24 that some were persuaded and some weren't, which is not unusual. We saw that time and again. It says that they kind of departed from Paul after he finished with a quotation from Isaiah the prophet, which I'll read again here out of the New King James this time. Go to this people, it says in verse 26, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they, sh lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Uh, in verse 28, Therefore let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And the Jews uh, departed with that and had a great dispute. And then it says that Paul dwelt there two whole years in his own rented house, receiving those who would come, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So that's it. That's the end. You tell me that's the end of the story. I, I say no, that's not the end of the story. It's the end of this book we call Acts. It leaves leaves off there. So what does that mean? Why does why does the story stop there? Did Paul not go on and speak to the emperor, uh, make a defense before the emperor? What was the result of that? I'm not sure why the book stops here. The story is certainly not over. But uh, the discussion we started last week does have a lot of merit. The events that transpire from this point are pretty irrelevant. It uh, doesn't really matter the defense that Paul made before the emperor. The emperor didn't believe. He, didn't, he, he made no change. And Paul's influence didn't go away. He had other things that he did that we do know about. So what is the implication of this? What will you do because Acts stops the way it stops? Is the story over? It goes back to kind of what I was saying about the end of chapter 27. And last week, again, what I was saying about the end of the book of Luke and really all the Gospels. The story of Jesus Christ does not end with the resurrection or his return to heaven. It doesn't end in Acts chapter 2 with the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles. It doesn't end in Acts chapter 2 with the sermon that Peter gave calling on the people to be baptized for the remission of their sins, the establishment of what we could recognize as the church. It doesn't end with the events that have transpired throughout the book of Acts. The story of Jesus Christ doesn't end. It's going on now. If we're a Christian, it should be playing itself out in our lives, not to end, but to continue. The implication is God made a lot of overtures to get people to do God's will on earth through this word, 
in the name of Jesus Christ, we wear that name. If we wear that name, we should be doing those things that God has called us to do. It's not for our salvation. If we've accepted Jesus Christ, we're saved through his grace. Our response to that saving grace should be working, doing the will of God in place of our own will. We focus on making a living, taking care of our family. Those are things that we need to take care of in our lives. We need to be providing for ourselves and our families and loved ones. But we need to be putting God first when we make those decisions. Paul put God first, and the implications were dramatic in his life. It changed the entire course of his behavior. His name changed. So what is the implication in your life? What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? I haven't done as well as I'd like to think I'd done. I would have done. There are many things about the decisions I've made in my life that I can look in hindsight and see were not the best decision for my life as a servant of Jesus Christ. But I can't dwell on the things that I've made mistakes on in the past. I can only focus on how to change my future. The same goes for you. You can't dwell on the mistakes you've made. You can accept God's forgiveness and change your life, repent of your ways if that's needed, and go forward making the best decisions you can to serve God with what remains of your life. We're going to talk more about Acts next week. Uh, as I've said from the start of this presentation, I want to do uh, a more of a discussion type approach. So I've left some gaps in the material that, that I have presented. Next week we'll start uh, a video, maybe a couple of videos in the next couple of weeks that address some of those gaps from Acts chapter 24 to the end of, of Acts. And I hope that you will join me then. Remember that services are going to be this morning at 10 a.m. So if you can join us, please be there. We've had great response the past couple of weeks. It's been wonderful to see everybody gathered together to worship the Lord together. God bless. Have a good week.